Welcome. It's up to you guys. Hi, everybody. Uh, give me a second to get used to hearing my own voice. That always takes a while. Uh, so uh, we are here today to talk about uh, extensions, uh, onboarding extensions, uh, how we approach that uh, at Microsoft, uh, a process that we uh, follow and think that it also applies to on-prem deployments of PostgreSQL and to other clouds. And the intent is to raise your awareness ab about some of the things related to extensions, but also hopefully to get you to understand why it takes us a while to just install a new extension on the service that you may want. Uh, so my name is uh, Adam Volk, uh, as I was nicely introduced, thank you. Uh, I'm a principal uh, program manager at uh, Microsoft for PostgreSQL, and with me is... Hi, I'm Nacho Alonso. I'm also a product manager at, uh, at uh, Password SQL in, in Azure, in Microsoft. Um, and yeah, we're gonna talk about what does it take to onboard extensions. Um, in, in Postgres. Um, as you may know, extensions are a huge thing in, in Postgres. Uh, extensibility of the engine is, uh, is a huge ecosystem on, on top of the, of, on the, of the engine. Um, it's very powerful, but at the same time, it's very, uh, with so much power, it, com it, comes, it should come with responsibility, right? So we are gonna discuss all those aspects. So uh, the brief agenda for today and uh, some information, like we like to have interactive sessions. So if you have questions during, like feel free to raise your hand and shoot. We will try to engage immediately. Uh, as for uh, the agenda today, yes? Will you be sharing slides? Yes, we will be sharing slides and anything that you see, including code examples, and hopefully they will break the same way as they do for us. Uh, so uh, the agenda for today is uh, extensions in PostgreSQL. We will very briefly tell you what those are, though I expect all of you already know. We will show a minimalistic extension that we shamelessly stolen from the PostgreSQL docs. Uh, we will go into some of the nitty gritty areas of compiled code and what that can do. And then we will go into auditing. Okay, is that better? Thank you, uh, getting used to the audio setup. <clears throat> okay, so Nacho, go ahead. So this is a comprehensive list of uh, things that you can do via extensions or the way you can extend Postgres using these extensions that you can create very simple extensions on which you only wrap up SQL objects uh, like functions or data types or views or SAR procedures, right? And you can wrap them in a name function that you can distribute it to your users and you can uh, control the life cycle of that extension through their different versions so that you can grade them, downgrade them. And, and, but you can do much more complex things. Like, I don't know if you've heard of Citus. Um, it's a sharded distributed database built on top of multiple instances of Postgres eventually. Um, um, that is built with a single extension, right? So there, there is an extension that is so powerful that it can do all of that. Um, but you can do things like uh, define user-defined functions or deploy user-defined functions, procedure, SQL functions. You can overload functions, um, uh, implement functions in SQL or in C language or in Rust. That is more and more common these days. Um, and you can with those extensions, you can also hook into or implement your own functions that are, you can hook into the engine so that the engine, when it goes through some code path, it will invoke your function and you can transform or vary the way in which the engine is behaving or you can simply monitor or audit or do anything you like. Um, uh, you can define user-defined types, operators, um, implement with data types, um, metadata or information that is used by the query planner when, they, when a query tree is being optimized. You can implement data structures as indexes um, and access methods to access those, those, those data structures. Um, so those are the index methods, the strategies, or support routines that are mentioned here. You can do basically 
as much as you know what to do with C or, or and and the more you know about the the uh, primitives that Postgres exposes, then the more you can do, obviously, and the better you can do. But it's super powerful. So with that uh, in mind, uh, a minimalistic extension, like the only thing that you need is actually two files for a bare minimum extension. And you may want to move forward in the room as there will be some code on the screen and terminals that you may not read from the back. Uh, the minimal thing is like a SQL file that will create your SQL objects and uh, a control file that defines uh, what this thing is. There is a make file that helps you in installing the extension. It simplifies some of the stuff you can do without a make file if you can just move the files in the right places. Uh, but that, that's the bare minimum that you can do. And the simple make file that we have here is uh, the per extension from the PostgreSQL documentation. It defines the extension name. It defines uh, the data file that will be installed, the migration script. It tells PostgreSQL, uh, it, it uses the PGXS, uh, the extension system, build system, uh, make file macros uh, that tell the make uh, system how to work with PostgreSQL files, where to place them, and it uses pgconfig to find where things are for your PostgreSQL installation. If we can move forward. Uh, for the control file, this is also very basic. It defines a comment of what this is, the default version, that in this case it's not relocatable. Uh, next, please. Uh, and this is how it looks like when you install the extension. Uh, so you run make install and it creates a directory for extensions and it also uh, moves the two files to the right place. Like if you did the copy yourself, you don't need a make file in this very simple case. Uh, and uh, Nacho, maybe you can show us uh, how that looks in practice. Sure. So. Um Okay, so this is the directory on which we have the make file that uh, Adam referred to and the pair control file whose content he also exposed. So the only thing, thing that we haven't uh, uh, shown yet is, is the content of the script file, the SQL file that contains the SQL objects for that version 1.0. Um, we, we can have a quick look into it. So, um, so the first line is just a comment and a, like a safety line so that if you invoke this SQL script from PSQL, it will use those metadata commands to just prompt a, a message saying that you're not supposed to run it from PSQL, but rather through the create extension command and, and then it quits SQL, uh, PSQL. And then the definition of the objects that it'll create which is a data type called pair that ex, uh, consists of, to construct a, uh, an instance of this data type, you need to pass it a couple of text, instances of text or a couple of strings named there as K and V uh, because it's a key value pair, right? Um, then a function that is a helper function that acts as a constructor. So you can use this function to construct an instance of pair by passing two arguments of type text, and what it'll do is it'll produce a row of two elements, like an array of two elements, and it'll be a casted to the pair data type that is defined above. Uh, it also defines an operator that also allows you to, using two arguments, one, of the, one to the left and one to the right of that operator, you can instantiate or you can produce a, a, an instance of a pair. Uh, by means of invoking this pair function above, right? Then, then two helper functions to interact or to transform uh, instances of pairs. Uh, one to lower the keys and the value, the key and the value of a pair, and one to concatenate two pairs. You pass it two pairs, and it produces a single pair where the key of the resulting pair is the concatenation of uh, the two keys from the input pairs and the uh, resulting 
pairs value is the concatenation of the values from, from the two inputs. So, so can we install it and see how it works? Sure. I wish I could. Um, so um, we are going to use make, as Adam explained, right? And uh, with make alone, it would do nothing in this case because we don't have any source code to build, right? We, we have a very simple extension. We, we only want to install the SQL files file in this case for now, and, and the control file, right? So for that, we do make install. And this is, um, as shown on the screen, is creating the directory where it'll produce, um, where, it, where it will put the resulting files of the compilation. Um, not a compilation, it's bringing those static files and copying them over to, to that, this directory. The location of this directory is being um, fetched from PGXS, which is Postgres extension system or build infrastructure that Postgres provides so that it facilitates uh, the, the building of, of extensions. And it's simply copying the pair control file into the directory where the engine will look for it and also the SQL file is copying it there. So with that, we have build the extension and install the extension on a given instance of Postgres, on a given cluster. But we have not yet created the extension on any database in that cluster so that we can refer to the objects that were part of that SQL file. Okay, okay so can we create the extension and maybe uh, create a pair? Yeah, so this is the way you probably are familiar with the create extension statement. Uh, what this is doing is, um, uh, sorry. Um, Don't crush it yet. No. Okay. Um, we're gonna be playing with a couple of extensions in this example, right? But for now, uh, this one, um, I forgot to remove the files, the, the mall extend. Uh, but what this function, this uh, function, the P, uh, sorry, view, PG available extensions does, is enumerates all the control files that are in a particular directory for this installation, and it produces rows with metadata that is found within those control files. So the name of the extension, the default version, and the comment, I don't know if you recall, but those were part of the control file. And the install version is not being picked from the control file, but it's being selected from the metadata that is created in the context of this database for um, once we created the, the extension in here, right? So with that, we have the extension um, created, and then with this meta command in PSQL, we can check what objects this extension has created. Um, as you can see that, uh, uh, thankfully, match is what, what was defined in the, in the SQL file. Uh, three functions and one operator and one type. Okay. Now, to your question, if I can create, how do I create an instance of a pair? Um, two ways. I can use the operator, the tilde greater than operator, passing two arguments as operands um, so that I can do like pg a type of um, um, text, that's uh, so. mm. So this operator is taking the two operands and is producing a pair. How do I know it is a pair? Because this, there is this other function, pg type of, which gives me the type of the resulting object. Now, if we want to see how it looks like, if we render this text, there it is. That is the pair, key value pair. And can I also run lower on it? Sure. So we do have this lower function, right? Whose logic will lower the text of the key, lower the text of the value, and produce a new instance where those two values are lowered? 
So, so Nacho, this is making me quite un uneasy. Like, it looks cool, but also uh, I don't see pair uh, mentioned anywhere here. So some code is being executed, creating a data type. I don't know what code that is. So how do you work with that? <laughs> yeah, good question. So this is, um, how does Postgres know when you write this syntax that this syntax is valid, first of all? And how does it bind each of those elements to a keyword or to an entity um, in the context on which it is being executed or on the different places it can search for, for that information? <coughs> so it happens that all of this is persisted as metadata in the database. So the operator is persisted as metadata, and that's the reason why uh, the, the algebraizer can go and check for, uh, in the catalog, if there is some operator with this name, right? Or if there is some function with this name. Are you familiarized with this function in Postgres? What does it do? Right, but what it takes as an input. And this is not what I'm passing, right? Because I'm not calling that function. I'm calling the function that this extension implemented. So and back so, to the point, you, you can have overloads of functions or data types or operators that can exist on different schemas, can be defined on different schemas, and you cannot easily tell which one you're using, right? And that has many implications, right? Because uh, something that's named lower here can do absolutely a different thing than I expect when reviewing that part of code. Uh, so if we go back to the migration script, I noticed the concat uh, operator that it implements. And uh, I, I think I now understand why it does that, uh, which is the, uh, on the bottom of the page, there's this huge syntax operator. Can you maybe explain why it's so weird instead of just doing pipe to concatenate the two? Yeah, so this is very important to do when you're authoring an extension. If you want to protect yourself, uh, your reputation as a, an extension author, and if you want to protect the users of your extension, you need to make sure that you narrow the scope of the things that you are using, the artifacts that you're using, to the ones you, you really want to use. You don't want to leave anything at random. So for example, if we want to cast this to our pair type and not to any other type, in, this, in the uh, extension script, um, we can cast it to this special keyword, which, which is interpreted by PGFX, PGXS as this is the location or the schema where this extension is being created. So within that schema, I'll go ahead and check for a type with this name, only within that schema. I don't care if, if that type exists in any other schema. I will focus just on that one. And back to your question, same thing can happen related to operators. If I want to make sure that the concatenation uses the native built-in con text concatenation operator, which exists in the PG catalog. I have to explicitly fully qualify the operator name because I've, if I just name it like pipe pipe, it might work, right? And I, I might end up invoking um, the operator that I want to invoke. But if the search path is changed uh, by the user that is invoking this function, they might end up invoking another pipe pipe or concatenation operator that exists on a different schema and getting like wrong results. And this is important because uh, those installation scripts, they will be then executed on your system and that system may be trusted or untrusted in certain levels. Uh, so for example, a malicious user may create a database object that overloads a function that could resolve to something that's not fully qualified in this installation script. And then when I'm installing my extension as a super user, I'm suddenly calling into a function or trigger or operator defined by somebody with lower privileges escalating that uh, code execution. And for that reason, it's not simply taking an extension and putting it on the system and we are done. 
we should be looking at it holistically from the aspect of what does it do in those installation scripts and is it not, is the author of the extension not malicious, that's usually the case, but also was the code defensive enough to prevent somebody else from abusing that uh, well intent written script into a way that the author didn't predict. So we will go into a bit more complex example of a makefile and how things can go wrong, uh, if we can go next. So this is, I, I know it will be hard to read, but this is a makefile you may recognize from the pgcron extension. Uh, we did some uh, malicious adjustments to it. Uh, can anybody spot any malicious adjustments? I know it's too small to do that. Okay, uh, next. So uh, this is how, it inst uh, how the installation of that extension looks. Can anybody spot something here? Uh, yeah, the permissions are okay, 644 is okay. Yes? Very good, like uh, please approach us for a pair of socks at the Microsoft booth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that, that's very good, like I actually didn't expect anybody to notice. Uh, can we go forward, Nacho? Uh, and forward. Uh, so yes, this is correct, it, it installs a per SQL file. Uh, now this is a very uh, simple example. Usually you would have tons of output and we could try to hide that in the output or even not produce that line in the output and you would probably not notice anything wrong. Uh, and this is the modification that we did uh, in the makefile uh, itself. Uh, so Nacho, do you want to go over it? Yeah, so, so basically during the make install process here, um, this file, in order to produce this file, it's getting the a file called malextend.sql content and it's dumping it into malex 10 dash dash 1.0 dot sql right but not only that it's also executing this line so that the same content is being copied over to another file called pair dash dash 1.0 dot sql so the reason why we scatter the changes throughout the files was to make it more difficult to, to spot them uh, but and you can even make it way more difficult to, to, to spot them um, so, uh, can you guess what is the problem that this can cause? Because we are, now we are talking about a different extension. This is mall extend extension. It's not pair extension, right? But this extension is producing and is installing a, fa a file called pair dash dash 1.0 dot SQL. Does it remind you to? Yeah. Correct. It, it, it can override the file that was produced by the other extension. Right. It actually will, because it, it'll have the permissions to do that. So, so to make that more visible, we modified the installation script of this extension and what it uh, replaces with this uh, brace, soy, malo, I'm bad uh, exception, uh, so that we see when we try to create the extension what is actually being executed. And uh, Nacho, I think you can uh, show us how, th this is how it should look without any modifications, that, that slide that we saw, but we can move on to demonstrating it. Okay. Yeah. So let's make you install this one. This one with binary. No, it installed. It's just harder to see because there's more output. Last line, you see? Yeah, yeah. This is the content of pair dash dash 
1.0.sql, and this is the content of malextent from which that file was built, and also the this one was built, right? So it shouldn't be touched in the pair uh, dash dash 1.0.sql file because it, we will distribute it now, we will deploy it, and we'll be overriding the other one, the other extensions file. Can you guess what can happen now? Once this other extension has been installed and it has deployed that other SQL file that matches the name of the other extension file and has been overridden, will the other extension fail now somehow? Or it won't? Or when would it fail? When would it cause a problem? My guess is that the only failure would occur if you try to install both extensions, so both the one, um, the pair and the the other name that I forget <laughs> what the name is, right? But if you try to install basically the new one, it will behave like you just have the pair. If you try to install pair, it will only behave like it has pair, right? Okay, but pair extension is already installed in the Postgres database. I have not uninstalled it. I have not dropped it yet. Yeah, but basically for new sessions, it will I guess for new sessions in the Postgres, it will raise extension, but for the old sessions, it will still work because it's in memory for them, isn't it? Uh, there is no binary here for now. So the, yeah. this is pure SQL object. So the, 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 the trick here was in the SQL script. When is the SQL script executed? Just create when you run create extension, right? So only when you create extension that the content of that file will be executed because it, it, unless we drop it and recreate it, we won't see it, right? But if but we'll do that, we'll drop extension and we'll create it again. It was working before and it isn't now. We didn't rebuild the extension. We built another one, but it happened that that one was overwriting this file. So, so, so the lesson, uh, the lesson from this is that. Uh, you should, uh, first of all, don't build install extensions on production. I hope nobody does that. Uh, but you have to assume that you know the code that's being executed during the build, it can do anything that you can do. If it can modify files in PostgreSQL, it can replace uh, files of other extensions. And maybe the intent of the author of that extension is to take over your system, and they cannot do that from their extension. But if they can trick you into replacing a different file of a different extension and that extension is created by your system with elevated privileges, then you just executed somebody else's code in a privileged setup. Uh, so that's this uh, specific case. Uh, I think we can move forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we saw the consequences of that. So how can the make files hurt you? Like the make files can steal the secrets from your, your build host. Anything that you store there, maybe access to your build system, so to your staging environments. It can replace the files on, on the target install, uh, including PostgreSQL configuration files, not only extension files. There is no mechanism preventing that if you're not looking for that yourself. And it can do code execution during build, like uh, placing in backdoors, exfiltrating data, overriding, changing files outside of the build directory. It can mine Bitcoin on your systems if it wants to, if you're not checking for that. Can we go next? If I were you, I would be worried because there's a make file coming through the door now. <laughs> okay, so control files. Uh, control files uh, themselves, they feel safe. Uh, because it's just a key value pair of uh, this is this and this is the value for that. Uh, so here's a common defined, a default value, trusted equals true, relocatable, there's nothing wrong here, right? Well, if we move forward, there's this trusted true. So can I trust this? Uh, hell no. Like, th this shouldn't be trusted. Like, who decided that it's trusted? That's the question you should ask. And if you look at PostgreSQL documentation, uh, slide forward, please. 
there's this documentation on trusted parameter that this generally should not be set to true for extensions that could allow access to otherwise super user only abilities, such as uh, file system access, uh, and also marking extension trusted requires significant extra effort. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, therefore, a trusted extension is extremely expo exposed from a security standpoint, and all its scripts commands must be carefully examined to ensure that no compromise is possible. Because what Trusted does in PostgreSQL, it says that somebody vouches that this is so trusted that an untrusted user can create this. Because this will uh, execute all of the stuff in a trusted uh, in, a, in a trusted setup. So, unless you actually verified that you can trust that this does nothing wrong and doesn't expose anything that somebody can abuse this trusted variable should never never be set to true. So don't assume that something says trusted, it's, it's tr trusted. Uh, next please. And same for like super user, this big caution is taken directly from documentation. Uh, when you're installing extensions, you have to assume that you trust the extension author to the level that you trust them to do anything on your database. Extensions can do anything that PostgreSQL can do they can write files, read files, modify data. So when you're installing an extension, you're ceding that power to the extension outer in an indirect way, so you have to verify what you're installing. Uh, next, please. So uh, here be dragons, we go to the uh, compiled code and what compiled code can do. So this is a very simple C code um, example of an extension, you don't need to know C. What you need to know is this defines this amazing function, crush my DB. Uh, and what it does is, in this version that stopped working right before this talk, so we had to come up with new, it was writing twice the amount of memory it should be into the parameter that you provided to, hoping that it will overwrite random memory and cause problems. Uh, so let's move forward. And it stopped working, he means that it's, it, it, it didn't crash. It was overwriting memory. But, but if it didn't overwrite memory to the point that it, it crashed, uh, yeah. crashed the, the, the process because of a sick fault or an access violation, then you wouldn't notice until maybe much later, right? Because you could be corrupting any data structure in memory. So if we look at this, uh, this is a crash, and let's see the bigger version of this. Yep, the, the, the left hand side is the output from the PSQL that was executing the function, the crash my DB function, and the right hand side is the output of the server log after the SIGFault SIGFAL occurred. So this is magnified. Yeah, so here we call crash my DB hello, and we see that the connection has closed. Uh, so what happens is PostgreSQL noticed that, well, there's a SIGFault of one of the connected processes. In PostgreSQL, every connected client has shared memory. So if there's shared memory working on shared buffers, that's our database data. So we have potentially data corruption. So the safest thing to do is uh, shut down and be put into recovery mode because we are potentially corrupting data. Uh, so this is what happened. It terminated, it restarted, it started recovery. Uh, and it actually has a problem in recovery because we happen to overwrite the wall uh, in our random writing of memory. Fortunately, there were no transactions, so it recovered uh, without any data loss because we were not writing any data. But you can see, like, it's a crash. And that's a happy path. Like, it's, we, we were super lucky that it crashed because it ha could have been overwriting, like, one byte or two bytes of memory for months and there would be silent data corruption creeping in into the data and being persisted into walls until it's too late and we have actual data loss. Uh, let's move forward and let's uh, try to crash it. Maybe in the interest of time we can continue and we leave the demo for the end. Okay, let's leave the demo for the end. Uh, so what can uh, the C code do essentially? The C code can do anything that PostgreSQL can do. It can write memory, read memory, any memory including all the production data that you loaded into your database that may be hidden behind permissions and access models, it can just read memory. It doesn't care what you say or who you say can read that data. 
Uh, it can use the network, it can write read disk uh, files, it can register hooks, callbacks. Nacho, do you want to take that? Oh yeah, yeah. I briefly mentioned that at the beginning. That there are certain hooks that you can that the passwords can call you if you implement them and have registered them. Um, like at points when passwords is going to emit an error before the error is emitted, it'll check if somebody registered a, a callback function or a hook uh, to be called before it goes through the natural standard path. Or when it's uh, analyzing parsing uh, the text of your query, it can call your hook. So you can modify the query or in any way or just inspect what it has. Or during execution, um, there are four steps, uh, start, run, uh, finish, and, and that, that the, those are four hooks during query execution that you can register hooks for to be called. Um, so to capture, um, audit, or monitor what's happening in the system, that's a way extensions like PG audit or many more uh, behave, PG start statement and so forth. Uh, you can define callbacks, you can crash your DB, we'll, we'll see it in a minute in the demo, or you can even break other extensions. Uh, if, you, if you're not a, like a good, if you don't behave as a good citizen in the uh, extension um, space, right? And it, th those bugs are not easy to, uh, to discover or to, to diagnose, and, and sometimes um, because may, they might involve race conditions or they might depend on the order in which the extensions are chained, the conflicting extensions are chained. Um, so um, it, it's not easy to, to, to debug, but you can do as much as you can do in C code running inside the uh, address space of the, any of the backend processes of Postgres, including Postmaster, and with the power that you have under the identity with which that service is running, all those processes are running. Okay, okay so uh, to not discourage you from using extensions and to not leave you empty-handed, uh, some uh, we've been doing some of those things like going through those extensions and discussing it, but this is roughly the process that we follow if we can go forward. So you should start by something that wasn't touched on here, which is reviewing the licensing, including all the dependencies and dependencies of those dependencies. It may not be as important uh, for you on-prem until somebody comes in to audit that you're adhering uh, any licensing that you may have in those dependencies. Uh, you should uh, review the make files we've done here. We know what they can do. You should uh, review the control files for the same purpose of what is it trying to define and is it proper. You should uh, review the upgrade scripts that we didn't touch upon, but apart from the the initial object creation, every new extension version will have upgrade scripts that can have the same problems as the initial scripts and should be reviewed for that purpose. Uh, you should uh, check for files created during uh, the build and installation, so all the artifacts that are produced from this. Uh, the object files created, as Nacho showed with the backslash dx uh, psql command, you can review what an extension actually creates. Uh, you can check what the SO file links against, like what libraries are linked. Maybe it links to libxz or something else that itself has issues that you need to find, or maybe statically links stuff. And then you need to grab the code for hooks because there's no nice existing tooling to check what hooks does an extension use, and that's a hint maybe somebody could implement a cool tool around that. Uh, can we go forward? And this is actually uh, an example I ran uh, yesterday or the day before uh, on the PG Parquet extension developed by Crunchy Data, uh, the license check. Because I wanted to like take a look, uh, they've written it in Rust, which is very easy to, ch to check. There's this cargo license command. There's over 300 dependencies in this project. Uh, and there's like this uh, custom license for something called ring. I didn't know what ring is. I checked, it looks like a boring SSL wrapper. So it has a mixed licensing case to review, but that's an SSL library. I looked if it links against the open SSL or boring SSL, it doesn't. 
So that means it statically compiles that. So what are the consequences for me if I wanted this on Azure? Well, what happens if Boring SSL has a security issue? How do I find out about it? What do I have to do then? Uh, well, I need to recompile the extension because it's statically linked. It doesn't, uh, I, I cannot just replace it on the operating system. And then uh, even when I uh, do that, like how do I get that deployed? How does that look like? What are the other issues that this may cause? So uh, that's some of the, oh, and another one is, uh, like if I'm deploying to a FIPS enabled system, uh, FIPS has requirements of what crypto libraries can be used. So can I actually deploy this on a FIPS enabled system? Like is this allowed uh, with this crypto module? And also uh, in this case it's cool because it's a well reputed TLS library like Boring SSL. But what if it's like little Jimmy's crypto and we now want to store credit cards with it? That's not cool, right? So you have to check everything that's done. Uh, finally, maybe Nacho. Yep. So you should also review the content of the make file um, to determine what is being built and what is being installed. And ideally, there shouldn't be any uh, network activity during the build process. Uh, it should be self-contained, uh, neither inbound nor outbound. Um, so, so th these are the most important aspects to review in, in the make file. So we, we also looked at the control file. Uh, is there more than one? Uh, is it trusted? Like is trusted used? Uh, what are the dependencies? Because dependencies can depend on, uh, sorry, extensions can depend on other extensions. Read all the variables used, cross check with documentation. Next. Review the upgrade script. So is search path set? Are objects fully qualified? Are functions explicitly casting to avoid uh, overload hijack that we discussed? And are there any security definer functions who they work in a way where you, the, the object, the, the, the code is executed from the privileges of the person that defined them, not the person that calls them. So it's usually a vector of privilege escalation in PostgreSQL. And next. So uh, finally, uh, what you can do is build in a Docker jailed container, examine all the files that are touched by an extension, look at the network activity, verify the reputation of the authors of the extension, like who, who develops it, the origin of the code you're put, pulling in, and all the dependency chain. That's pretty much it. Uh, and if you uh, want, like, if you like PostgreSQL, we actually have a uh, podcast on PostgreSQL that you might want to listen to, talking Postgres. And there's also a conference that we are going with in the, into the fourth year, uh, POSET, if you can sw swap the slide, Nacho, to the next I one. I see some speakers here in the room. <laughs> and uh, I think we have like two minutes left, so yes. if there are any questions. Hello, we have five minutes of questions if you want. Oh, great. I just wanted to ask, uh, is, is any work done on the central registry of the Postgres extensions, or that's impossible? If you know what, what I mean. Not like NPM mm -hmm. for Postgres, but something centralized. Uh, so, so I think there was a meeting, uh, uh, the, the, I think there is like an ongoing uh, talk between some companies on doing that, like I personally did not participate in it, so I have nothing to share on that, but I think there is some work around that. Uh, you, you can reach out to me afterwards or we can talk at the booth and, and find out. Um, sorry, does that, does that mean like in order to be safe, basically every institution has to, you know, have like have this scrutiny process themselves before they can onboard an extension? I mean, it, it, it's, yeah, I should say it's, it's up to you. Either you do that or you relied on what others are doing, but are you sure somebody's doing that work for you? 
So who is accountable for um, any data exfiltration or any data corruption incident caused by any extension that you have on uh, That That's a risky part. So it, it takes time and very specialized resources that you know about security and, and um, uh, development and, and Postgres engine to validate the extensions. But unless there is like a committee that uh, open committee that certifies the extensions, then you have to rely on many people. I've seen many people, I'm kind of new to Postgres, like been six, six months or something into Postgres. And I've seen many people using, picking extensions from open source repositories and onboarding them into their on-prem installations without paying attention, just because functionally they provide the, the functionality that they require. Uh, and also it's not always malicious intent, like uh, th there may be well-intended extensions that happen to just break with each other and you will find out in production with data corruption, for example. Questions? Okay, we don't have any more questions. Thanks for, for the talk, guys. Thank you.